to the book of Romans, please. May I direct your attention to the 13th chapter. We will be reading verses number 11 through 14. We missed Sister Hammond this morning. She did report in and said that she had some business involving her daughter, but she would look forward to seeing everybody tonight. Isn't that great? Amen. Thank God for Sister Hammond. We do miss her. Uh, Brother Nathaniel, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, and verse number 2. Brother Jesse, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, and verse number 6. How many of you believe something better is coming our way? I sure do. It's wonderful here. Not that I'm looking for anything better. God has been good to us and been better to us than what we deserve. But it's good to know something better is coming our way. Uh, Brother Nathaniel, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 2. For he saith, I have, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Yeah. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Did y'all notice something? Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Brother Jesse, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us not sleep, comma, as do others. So the Apostle Paul was pointing out that you'll notice there's a whole lot of sleeping going on. I want to preach a sermon the Holy Ghost has titled, What Time Is It? Could we stand right now and read our text? Romans chapter number 13, verses number 11 through 14. The Bible said, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake, out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Looking again at verse number 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, as Sister Wooten said a few months ago, what would we do if we didn't have you or have one another and were unable to come to the house of the Lord and gather together? What would we do? Lord, I do thank you for this people. I thank you for this house of worship that we call the house of God. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach. I want to be obedient to your calling. Pray that you would set a guard at my mouth and help me to say the things that you would have me to say, nothing more or less. Anoint the ears of this thy people that they might hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, God. Through the preach word of God, through your words. Lord, let these sayings go below the shoulders. Let them saturate the heart, mind, soul, body, God, we pray. Let these words be received and may they be doers and not hearers only. And we ask that we could depart this place joyfully and not sorrowfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, amen. what time is it? What time is it? All right, answer them and say, I have no idea. The elders at Bethel said, take the clock off the wall. There you go. That's right. Amen. Reading our text again, Romans chapter number 13 and verse number 11. And then knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Our text is found in a New Testament book of the Holy Bible, the book of Romans. This book is probably the longest letter addressed and sent to any group of people by the beloved Apostle Paul. Paul's target audience was Roman believers people who were gathering for religious services in the name of Jesus Christ, people that had forsaken former lifestyles and former religions that they practiced, 
And they were gathering together to worship the Lord. Does that not sound familiar? We've got two former Catholic altar boys in the building this morning who have forsaken Catholicism or in a Pentecostal holiness church this morning. Other people that are here have come from backgrounds that had nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And we find that these people were coming from all over Rome together together to hear the beloved Apostle Paul's words that were addressed to them in this epistle. They were gathering together for services, Brother Nathaniel. If they had not have been assembling themselves together, if they had been forsaking the gathering of the saints as the manner of so many were, they would have been unable to read this letter or to hear the contents of this letter read by the bishop of this church. And as we, the readers, read this letter for ourselves, we find this book of the Bible to be most informative regarding the plan of salvation and how the Apostle Paul believed that righteousness is important for all believers, both Gentiles and Jews. Certainly the Apostle Paul was no opponent to sanctification or separation. He was a proponent of sanctification and separation. We believe this as well. We believe that the children of God have been called out of darkness into the Lord's marvelous light. And we believe what is good for the goose is good for the gander. And that's what Apostle Paul was dealing with here. He was letting this multi-ethnic group of people know that what is good for the Jew is good for the Gentile. What is good for the Gentile is good for the Jews. And truly, the Lord is no respecter of persons but we do believe that the Lord is one who respects the faith and respects the faithful. However, the Lord is no respecter of persons. I'm sure that this particular church was filled with Gentile and Jewish believers. There are some in this building this morning that do not know what a Gentile is. A Gentile is any person of any nation that is not a Jew. And so we believe that this particular church was full of people that were both Gentile and Jewish believers. And it would not have taken very long for there to have been disharmony among this group had there not been a common denominator, Jesus Christ. Easily this church could have been segregated or divided. I mean in mere months there could have been some sort of disharmony and disruption in this family of God and people would have went their separate ways. But because of the kinship that's available to all of mankind through Jesus Christ, they were able to hold it together and keep it from busting apart at the seams. It also had a lot to do with a God called and sent man named the Apostle Paul, someone that had his finger on the pulse of the situation and was very sensitive to how the devil could come in and begin to sow seeds of disharmony and discord. So when you see there's an opportunity for discord or disharmony, you need to remember the denominator, and it is Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul desired to strengthen the body of Christ, not to tear it down. The Bible said that a wise woman buildeth up her house with her hands, but a foolish woman teareth it down with those same hands. I've seen some men within our holiness movement if they could only understand that tearing down that preacher or that evangelist is not good for our holiness movement. If we could all come together and build up one another, praying in our most holy faith and getting the Holy Ghost to help solidify our relationships one with another, I believe the church would be stronger. So the Apostle Paul, he believed that because of Jesus Christ being the common denominator, that these people could cohabitate in the house of God. I've heard before of churches splitting because another group of people came in to that local congregation. 
How many of you know that the United States of America noticed the error of her ways many long years ago, just like the author to the great hymn, Amazing Grace, realized the error of his ways, and we believe that we're supposed to love all people. So the Apostle Paul was not going to have it. There was no way he was going to allow this church to bust apart. He had a desire to strengthen those things that were beginning. In this age, we're supposed to be strengthening those things that are remaining. We feel that the Apostle Paul made it his business to unite the Jewish and Gentile Christians. These believers lived in a big place, the city of Rome. At this time, Rome was the epicenter of the Roman Empire. And Paul was not intimidated in the least by the emperor of Rome or his mighty empire because he was on a mission for the king of kings and the lord of lords. I believe it was in the book of Acts somewhere around the 18th chapter. Don't hold me to that. But somewhere in there we find where the apostle Paul was first introduced to these people and began to work among this congregation. This man was no doubt sent to work among these people by Almighty God and he did not let the Roman Emperor intimidate him or hinder him or his ministry one bit. You see these people in Rome and the Roman believers needed a wake up call. We've heard of people over the years receiving a wake up call from the Lord. Certain events or incidents have taken place place in the life and I've seen Sister Wooten tap them on the shoulder and say hey you somebody is trying to get your attention somebody is trying to give you a wake up call and that's what happened right here when men and women were busy doing whatever they wanted to do going about life the Bible said there would be times of these ages when people were busy they would be eating and drinking and making merry and they would get so covered about with this uh, that they would do it without God. Uh, there's nothing in the world wrong with eating and drinking uh, and having a good time. I did it last night. Uh, I'm not talking about drinking alcohol. Uh, I'm talking about drinking unsweet tea or the beverage uh, of your choice. But we must uh, remember when we do these things even when you're breaking bread among the believers you do it in the name of the Lord and we know that there were times when God would give nations or the entire world a wake up call because people were busy doing everything but focus on God as the epicenter of the Roman Empire Rome would have been a very busy place I feel like Fort Myers, Florida is a very busy place. As far as I know, Brother Nathaniel and I leave out Friday on our mission trip and we're going to fly out of Miami. Now, I know of assurance that that is a very busy place. And so Apostle Paul goes into a place where it's seemingly concerning the things of this world. They're not sloppy. They're not slumbering. And they're not sleeping. Brother Rocap taught a very timely lesson this morning. Talking about being diligent in business. And Brother Nathaniel told me. He said, have you thought about that word diligent? He said, diligent. A-N-T. As diligent as the ant is. I believe Brother Rocap's text was. Hey, consider the ant thou sluggard. I'm talking talking about the Roman Empire and the occupants of that Roman civilization were no sluggards. They were not slothful people. They were busy. But even busy people need to stop and take in what is being said by God 
through the word of God and through the preacher I've seen people over the years put their careers between them and Christ and they wonder why they begin to compromise it's because between those precious things that mean so much to them there is a spirit of apathy and lethargy concerning the things of God I want you to imagine the hustle and bustle of this busy place picture in your mind their busy city streets I'm sure the Roman people possessed time pieces and knew what time it was at any given time of day I'm sure they practiced punctuality I'm sure they were diligent in business they did not stand before common men they find themselves standing in the very epicenter of the Roman Empire you see it's safe to say that there was a time consciousness or a keen awareness of the hour of the day that it was at any time of the day have you ever noticed somebody that's habitually tardy they're never really properly aware of the time I want you to know concerning spiritual things there are a lot of people that are tardy when it comes to the things of God they have no awareness of all of the hour or the day that they live in they are unaware of the events unfolding I've never seen a more ignorant generation than this generation concerning end time events it seems like now if you even point it out to somebody not so likely they say oh I'm not worried about it we've been hearing about these things for 10, 20, 30 and 40 years all those advances in technology they don't worry me a bit it can't be the forerunner to the act of Christ oh no we've seen things like this before and they stand on the sidelines mocking and they don't realize we're not waiting on the game to start the game has already begun the race is on and we've got to run this race I'm talking about people that don't have a keen awareness of the hour the preacher can preach in the pulpit or out there in the city streets and brother stare they turn a deaf ear to the word of God they don't want to hear it hey I'm talking about people that lived in Rome that had an understanding that they had a schedule they had to hold to they had a daily routine that they kept but these people did not have very good spiritual routines but these believers must be reminded that we are on a spiritual clock that God is the one that controls time when time began ticking when time's clock began ticking God is the one holding the big bend if you would the time piece that is ticking for all of humanity how do you know how much time you've got left concerning your life how do you know that you'll live another 10 years or another 10 months how do you know you're not God but what we need to maintain is a spiritual awareness that God is keeping time I feel like these Roman believers were being reminded that we've got to be mindful of spiritual time very few people understand spiritual time you ask them what is it they have no idea what do you mean by spiritual time Somebody stands on the corner of a city intersection. And Brother Nathaniel, somebody holds a sign that says, time is running out. What does that mean to people that look at that sign? Does it mean that Dunkin' Donuts is about to close? Does it mean that Macy's is about to take their sale off? 
What does that mean? It means that at any moment your life could be snuffed away. It means at any moment your heart could quit ticking. Or it means we could reach the end of this age of dispensation of grace and that Jesus would come back for his church. You know, we need to know about spiritual time. And we need to know what time it is on that spiritual clock. This is why we've got to go to church and be faithful to the local assembly and have preachers that are preaching the things that God has laid upon their heart because our nature concerning spiritual things is to fall asleep. The spirit of Eutychus is upon so many people I'm talking about church people today they sit and hear men preach just like Eutychus heard the apostle Paul preach and a spirit of slumber has come as they sit in the window half of the body in the world and half of the body in the church that's a recipe for disaster that's a recipe for a fall I believe we are living in the age uh, of the great falling away. Uh, but we all do not have uh, to fall away. Uh, what we need to do is uh, hear the cry uh, of the bridegroom in the night uh, and realize all might be slumbering uh, and all might be sleeping. Uh, but behold, uh, the bridegroom comes. Uh, do you know what time it is? Uh, that's what the man was saying uh, to the ten virgins. Uh, do you have your own in your lap is a burning bride. Do you realize what time it is? The bridegroom is coming. I feel like if they had really known, Brother Gabriel, what time it was, they wouldn't have slept on. I believe that if the apostles that went into the Garden of Gethsemane with Christ to pray for an hour. That's all that Christ was requesting. Was just go to prayer meeting with me for one hour. Brother Jesse, I'm sure if they'd have knew that the time was 55 minutes in, they would have stirred themselves and woke up and said, at least I could pretend I've been with him for an hour. At least they could be awake to hear him pray the benediction. We're going to bring that prayer to a close and have an understanding of what his burden was. Oh, how can you miss the words of such a prayer? I mean, it's one thing to be within earshot, but it's another thing to have your ears unstopped and your attention on the details of the words of Christ. I'm telling you, if I could have been there, I believe I would have hinged everything in my life on every sentence he spoke to the master. I'm telling you, it's one thing to say, give us the format for prayer and teach us to pray. But it's another thing to listen and actually do it. They didn't realize they had an inkling, an inclination that he's about to be crucified. But they didn't have a full understanding, Brother Jesse. Huh? If they'd have realized the gruesome and gory things that were about to happen to their master, I believe they'd have had no problem whatsoever attending prayer meetings. They'd have had no problem whatsoever keeping their ears open. If Eutychus had a really knew, like Agabus knew that Apostle Paul won't be with us always. The Spirit of God was upon Agabus, and he was telling Apostle Paul that you need to be aware of the fact that bonds and affliction awaits you in Rome. There was one man in a congregation, two 
tuned in and listening to what the Spirit of God said. You know, Apostle Paul said, Agabus, these words don't move me, neither do they deter me from the purpose. I know what God has intended for me to do. I wonder if all of us knew what awaited us and we knew it was the appointed time for our martyrdom. If we denounce and defect Christianity, Apostle Paul was a man who was alerted to the things that befell him. I'm telling you right here tonight, in our church, there are people that know the Spirit of God has been moving and the Spirit of God is dealing with souls that it's time to be saved. I'm telling you here tonight, Romans 13 and 11, our text says, and not knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, but now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. There's a key word in that verse. It's knowing. Oh Lord, help us to know what time it is. How can we know what time it is? Let's continue reading down. Notice in verse number 12, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. The fact that the night is spoken of lets everybody know we're in a dark age. We're in a dark time. Everybody knows what happens at night time. That's when the roaches, the rats, the mice, and the evildoers come out to play. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this building right here this morning. Do you know the Bethel Holiness Church would be packed as well as many other churches if people simply understood the time? I'm not talking about what time is it on that watch on your wrist or on that timepiece on the wall or on that cellular device that you've got. I'm not talking about that digital clock. I'm talking about a spiritual clock. And I can look around and see that at time of night, at night time, this earth comes to a screeching halt. I'm talking about a physical darkness. You know the only ones that don't come to a halt when it becomes night time are the night shift workers, the night owls, the party animals, and the nocturnal creatures. The world reaches a grinding halt and it begins to slumber and sleep. In a message recently, one of our brothers was preaching and he said if you could just understand the importance of getting a relationship with God it would take precedence over the hobbies and the habits of this life. You see you would come to a grinding halt and awake out of your slumber and sleep and realize I must shake myself if somebody slipped me a spiritual knock wheel if I've been sung to sleep if I've been long to sleep if I go to my hands to sleep I've got to shake myself and come out of this sleep I just thought of this brother staring to his parallels the last Sunday morning's message God speaking to somebody last Sunday morning God said get me up and God's telling you basically wake up what time is it you need to look around and see what's going on. So I'm living the dream, they might say. Basically, they're saying I'm a party animal. I'm a nocturnal animal. I don't function the way God's told me to function. How many of you know a baby can get its days and nights mixed up? Sister Hal and I raised six children. A couple of them went through that phase. And when one of them goes through that phase, if mom and dad are not nocturnal creatures, there is a conflict of scheduling. And I want you to know there is a conflict of scheduling between the plans of the devil and God's itinerary. 
I'm telling you, God is in control of this world. And even creation itself is groaning for deliverance because of the bondage that the prince of darkness has brought upon humanity and creation itself. Hey, I believe this. They try to tell us the world is grinding to a halt. We better be expecting destruction in the future. Yeah, God's going to be the destroyer that destroys this world. You know, the Bible said that one of those great stars would turn to darkness while another one would turn to blood. And God's going to turn the lights out. Hey, I'm telling somebody this morning, you need to realize that you are not a night shift worker. You are not supposed to be living the night life in the nighttime, sleeping life away. I believe verse number 12 tells us that it is a dark time spiritually before the Lord returns for his people. During this night time, there are people that live that night life. During this night time, it's a time of unrighteousness and unregeneration. This is the most unrighteous and unregenerated generation this world has ever known. How do you know it's night time, preacher? What time is it? God told us in his word, in the days of Noah, every man done what was evil in his own imagination. The Bible talked about in the days of Lot, their imaginations were evil. So shall it be when the Son of Man returns. God has told us the next stroke is midnight. I'm telling somebody here in this building this morning, if you knew that we're sitting on 11, the 11th hour and the 59th minute and the 59th second before we begin eternity, you'd shake yourself for eternity. It's supposed to be a land of endless days. We feel like so many people love the nightlife. Well, the devil's got something for them. He's been programming them and grooming them for an eternity of nightlife. In hell, there is no light. It's darkness forever. But the torment of hell, beyond the pain and the agony, is this. That there is no mental rest. That there is no hope of salvation. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this day. You mean there will come a time when whoever calls on the name of the Lord cannot be saved? That breaks my heart. Because right now in this age that we call the dispensation of grace, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But people of the night, I hear them say it. I don't care who Jesus is. I don't believe Jesus is the only way. And brother Nathaniel, all they do is pull the shades over their eyes and they go to sleep. There's no light coming in. I wonder how many people in this building are those people that cannot sleep when there's a little bit of light in the room. Anybody? Sister Howell's one of those. Brother Sterrett's one of those. Brother Roadcap's one of those. Anybody in this building like Pastor that likes to at least have a little nightlight somewhere in the bathroom or somewhere so you're not tripping up and stumbling. Sister Wooten's one of those. Anybody else? Brother Jeremiah, Sister Jessica, Brother Steve, Sister Roadcap, Brother Philip, hey, there's uh, several more of us right here that like to have a little bit of light. Thank God for that. I told Sister Hal the other night after I tripped over a suitcase, I said, honey, this is why I like to have a little bit of light at night because nobody likes doing the peep rows into the foot of the bed. That is not a pleasant experience and people are fumbling around just like those men did in Sodom and Gomorrah and they're blinded spiritually. They're fumbling around 
around and taking their chances on religions that hey, accept homosexuality. I want to tell the devil something right here. After these saints of God prayed for me Wednesday night, there was no more sign whatsoever of anything wrong in my body. Brother Nathaniel sent me a text before bed. He said, Dad, there's a scripture concerning Apostle Paul being incessantly afflicted in his body and I thought about you but he said I appreciate you pops hey I want you to know in sickness or in health God's called me to preach and I've got a good group of people right here that are not intimidated by Rome or his empire or the devil the prince of the air I'm telling you we are kingdom saints and his light shines hey come on do you get that we've got spiritual authority. Sister Howe told me after church, she said I was chomping at the bit waiting on somebody to do what Sister Jessica did and obey God. Hey, I want you to know those are people that are children of the light and not children of darkness. I wonder how many people would just say, oh my pastor will be alright. Oh that elder will be alright. But now some people can tell that things are indicative of spiritual warfare and we've got to fight the good fight. Hey, I'm not fighting in the dark because when I fight this fight, as long as I've got his word, I'm fighting in the light. I ain't no shadow warrior. I'm a fighter in life. I'm telling you, do you know what time it is? It's time for somebody to shake yourself and join us in this I feel the Holy Ghost. The night time here is indicative of a dark time spiritually before the Lord returns for his people. There's going to be a great falling away and we're living in that because I have seen this to be true among Pentecostal and holiness people. Anybody that stands for the truth, preaches the truth, or promotes the truth somehow becomes the persecuted. Not everybody. It depends on your political affiliation. It depends on whether or not they're intimidated by you or your message. But it interests me that somebody down in somewhere in Timbuktu or in the mountains or in the valleys somewhere pastoring seven or ten people, how their words can be persecuted as long as they're not misaligned, malaligned, as long as they're biblically aligned, how people can find fault with the message of Noah, find fault with the message of Abraham, how they can find fault with the messenger of truth, the messenger of light. The Bible said that God's people, the men of God, would be the angel of the church. They would shed a light. Now, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. John the Beloved, also known as John, who wrote Revelation, said, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So we're living in a night time. And there are people living the night life. But the latter part of verse number 12, Brother Sterrick says, Let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. So wait a minute, we go from being party animals and cast off our unrighteousness and our unregeneration. And we're not just going to walk in shepherd's garments. We've got to put on an armor of light. So you go from being a partier and you come into light and you're a warrior. I've heard people say before, I never fought like I do now until I became a Christian. Stop and think about what you're saying. Because the devil lost his grip on you. I need to move on here. Our brother read 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6. Brother Danny, it said, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. This is the age of spiritual delusion and drunkenness, Brother Wood. People are drunk on every spirit but the spirit of truth. The Bible spoke to us in the book of Ephesians through the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus in one of his letters. He said, be ye filled with the spirit. 
you come to church and get filled up with light. Brother Danny said there's nothing like the sweet Holy Ghost. And you get filled up with the Holy Ghost. You go out into that dark age. You go out in that dark world or that dark worst place. They're going to notice you aren't just a child of light, but you've got on the armor of light. I went to uh, the Gulf Coast uh, Town Center last night to get a steak uh, and some ice cream. And Brother Jeremiah, he's not here right now. He took the bus children home, but he, he said, Dad, I've been looking at this motley crew around us uh, and these troublemakers uh, and these groups uh, of people. He said, I believe uh, there's going to come a time uh, when we can no longer do this uh, with our family for fear of our safety. What Brother Jeremiah was saying is, uh, there is something strange uh, about this present darkness. Uh, what he was saying is, I don't trust uh, these people. I told somebody uh, in this building, uh, you better make sure uh, you can trust uh, those that are around you. Uh, you better make sure uh, that you're the other line. Brother Jeremiah was stating, I'm seeing a lot of unrighteousness and unregeneration. I'm seeing a lot of unregenerated people, and I'm uncomfortable having my Leah here. He said, I can see it in a year or two not being able to do this. Hey, this lady pulled up about 30 minutes later. She was from South Florida. She got out just an old opinionated bitty. Not, not just a good, sweet old lady. She stepped out. She reminded me of some of our elders here. She wasn't out of the vehicle. Five seconds and told her other elderly friend, she said, let's go in Kilman's and get this ice cream while we can. She said, I love it that there's no snowbirds down here. She said, they just trample all over you. You can't even hardly get in line to get your ice cream. I love it. Let's get it while we can. Now I'm telling somebody in this building, you better wake up and get a hold of this while you can. You better stop struggling with peer pressure. You gotta stop worrying about what the children and doctors say. You gotta quit listening to the hideous voices coming out of them pubs. You better quit looking at them lower staircases and hearing what's coming out of hell beneath. And you better listen to what's coming out of that celestial city over the banisters of heaven. There's a great cloud of witnesses. There's a sunbeam of hope shining and saying, you can what brother Jeremiah was saying is I'm sick of this untoward generation that's what the apostle Peter said save yourself from this untoward generation which literally means preserve yourself from the perverted preserve yourself from the perverse generation I've heard some wonderful people of God say they are very concerned about all the spiritual lethargy, the spiritual indifference, apathy, and carnality that they are seeing today. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 6 speaks of being sober minded. You know what a sober person knows? What time it is? A slobbering drunk does not know what time it is. The Holy Ghost gave me that this morning. A sober person knows what time it is. A slobbering person does not know what time it is. I'm saying God help us to be sober, to be vigilant because the devil are adversary walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You might think you're hiding in the shadows, but the devil knows those hiding places, and he's the one that stages those dark places, the traps. When Garth Brooks sang that song, I've Got Friends in Low Places, years later, I was praying, and God spoke to me and said, preach, I've got friends in high places. Amen. Amen. I've had friends that have come out of dark places. He said, I've got friends in low places, huh? Dark places. Low places or dark places? High places or bright places? How many of you have been feeling the presence of God in our services? So why are we preaching along these lines? Why did Brother Sterrett preach along these lines? Get thee up. Get thee up. What time is it? 
Somebody check your timepiece. What time is it? A sober person is able to wake out of sleep, but a slobbering drunk just can't wake up. And the next morning, he says, I can't control myself. I couldn't control myself. I hear Christians now saying, I can't control it. Do you realize to say that is to acknowledge some sort of oppression or possession? I'm sorry I don't have control of myself. That's a scary thought, isn't it? There's a lot of people in the nut house or in the psych ward right now saying the same thing. Are we really thinking about what we're presenting and the way we're wrapping it? 2 Corinthians 6 and 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. Hey, in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There's some young children in this building that are not too young to be saved. There's some young people in this building that can have an experience with God and they can realize what time it is. It doesn't matter if you're five years old, 50 or 99 or 100 years old. Now is the accepted time. If you look at the latter part of Romans 13 and verse number 12 it says let us cast off the works of darkness hey the lost person must quit their night job have you ever heard somebody say stick to your day job because your night job's no good I'm telling somebody you have to stick to your day job and realize it is our duty and our spiritual responsibility to be children of the light Cast off the works of darkness. Cast off. Brother Jesse, come here. I'm going to put this one, not the snotty one that I've been spitting in, but I'm going to put this clean, fresh, iron hanky on your shoulder. Now I want you to show us how you cast that off. Let's say there's a disease. Wow, that's how you do it? You didn't even fold it back up, did you? Huh? You know what they say? There's a certain custom in some culture that if they fold the napkin a certain way that tells the server or the waiter or the waitress that they're coming back to their plate, don't take that plate. Now, I'm telling you, some waitresses need to learn since the house is the slowest eater they've ever seen. And there's been times they've grabbed her salad that was still 75% uneaten. And she comes back from the bathroom and said, Honey, I asked you not to let them take it. I said, They took it so fast, I just turned my head. Somebody sent me a text. So I looked up and it was gone. But there's people that didn't want their salad being gone and they would leave a sign that they were coming back. And Sister how maybe you need to put your napkin over that salad bowl. She said, what is this? What does this mean? Not, not, you ain't going nowhere yet. And so y'all notice Jesse ain't folding this, this hanky up real nice and neat, but he's going to cast it away, cast off the works of darkness. Thank you, Brother Jesse, and put on the armor of light. Now, I feel like right here there's been a whole lot of arming ourselves and getting ready for battle as children of the light around here. But we've got to cast off works of darkness if we're an unbeliever or if we're unregenerated. Brother Jeremiah, about 15 minutes ago, I told this church something you shared with me yesterday evening. So it's good to have you back, but catch up on it. But I believe that people must envelop themselves in the armor of light they must put it on well how can you put on an armor of light the easiest way to totally envelop yourself in the armor of light is to hold the lamp of God thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path it provides spiritual illumination I'm telling you you don't even have to worry about finding the enemy because it will illuminate it and identify it before you ever get to it. Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, come on, somebody. Speaking of the illumination of the word, what about the invitation of the gospel? Oh, I feel my heart breaking right now. I need the Holy Ghost to help me. Great sorrow. Just break my head. Oh, 
that every man everywhere would repent. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as Jesus wept, how I would have gathered you under my wing, but you would not. Oh, Apostle Paul was telling these Roman believers, lift them up. He said, you got to stay awake. One brother recently came around the corner at a convenience store looking for me. And he said, preacher, I need to talk to you soon. Did we get lunch? One of the first things he said was, not everybody's holding on anymore. It concerns me. Not very many people are living right anymore. It concerns me. But it's not that the invitation isn't going forth. I remember when that homeless man came to church. We had preached and he had prayed. He had ended up being apprehended and arrested and put away, incarcerated in the local jail. After three or four months, as the crystal will remember, he came to church. Because of those restless and sleepless nights in prison, when he got to church, he was comfortable in his surrounding. He wasn't worried about getting hit on the head, wasn't worried about being robbed or raped. He was comfortable, Sister Wooten, in the house of God. And I was thankful that he was comfortable in our presence. But what's sad is all the times he had shook himself and prayed, even at the service at night, he said, I'm sorry for sleeping on you, Pastor. He said, but I've had so many sleepless nights. I finally felt comfortable with my surroundings and just slept. I've seen it, Sister Wooten, over the years, the Spirit of God moving in a church service. And people that's attended service after service after service has got so comfortable and complacent in their surroundings. They've even learned how to sleep with a light zone. I've heard of people that prefer to sleep with lights on. How can anybody sleep in the midst of the Pentecostal movement? How can anybody sleep in the midst of the holiness movement? How can anybody sleep in the midst of a Bethel holiness church movement? How can anybody sleep? Because he said, awake, awake. Because now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. When you first believed, you stood up singing, I saw the light. When you first believed, you couldn't read enough of God's word. When you first believed, you had to tell somebody about it. The spirit of elimination and the spirit of invitation. You wanted to read the word of God and you wanted to share the gospel. Yea, I say unto thee, my children, is not this the very day? Is not this the very moment when you can do something about it? Yea, this day, this moment you can be saved. It is not my will that you perish. And it is not my will that you fall away. I say unto you, come unto me. This morning, and I will receive you, saith the Lord. Brother Jesse, come to the piano, please. In the church at Rome, 
not a Roman Catholic church, but in the church of Rome. There were believers who realized the night was spent and there was a new dispensation of grace. Christ was gathering his people from all nations of the earth. Could we stand this morning? In this moment. In this day now. Brother Nathaniel, I believe that verse is speaking to us that there can come a time when it will be unacceptable or too late. I find it very interesting that there would be a statement now is accepted time. Brother Wood, right now. And that's what the Holy Ghost just said. We look and there's 60 to 70 people present. We make the assumption that everybody's okay. I'm not interested in hearing who's not, who is. But what I want us to do is just come to the altar. Please come forward as a profession of your faith. And if you can't find a place up front, just kneel where you're at. But if you're lost especially, please come forward. If you need more of Jesus, please come forward. Meet him on his terms. Meet him on his condition. Say, I don't want to be lost. I must be saved. I must be saved. I must be saved. I must be saved. Hey! 